Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We continue with our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. We're still here in chapter 1 and uh, we were finishing up with verse 30 last time. We're going to back up to verse 27 and start from there and read to the end of the chapter. We might bring it all together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but, uh, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, last time we spent the video, the whole time thereof, in verse 30, expounding upon these things which are in Christ Jesus, and how that he has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, all these things we have in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And my friends, as God has brought all these things unto us, in and through Christ, His only begotten Son, and it is written that we might know these things. The Word of God is written unto us, my friends, that we might know and understand these things. Oh, how important it is that you have in your hands the very Word of God. And God brought that about. He gave us His Word. And sadly, my friends, over the past hundred or so years, many have let themselves be deceived by gainsayers and men who sought to destroy the Word of God and take it out of their hands and convince them that, well, that King James Bible is just full of problems. And many a preacher has fallen prey to that ideology the so-called scholars of our day would ridicule this and bring it down, not because it's not the truth, but because they have a profit in doing it. They have a profit, my friends, in getting you to give up what you have, or what you had here, and accept something new. And then not give you contentment therein that that's the fullness of it, and that you can be satisfied that therein is the fullness of God's Word, that you might know your Lord and Savior fully by it, and that these things you might be able to fully understand them. But they leave the door open, well, there's going to be something better on down the road. And when another version comes out, the same idea is set forth, well, it's not complete yet, and eventually we'll bring you something better. But all the time they're pulling you farther and farther away from the true word of God, which has stood for well over 400 years now, as the example of God's word unto English-speaking people. That we might know that that wisdom of God, which comes from Jesus Christ, for he is this word, the word incarnate, made flesh, our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ brought this word unto us that we might glory in Him in and through its understanding and not in the wisdom of men which is being used to destroy this very word of God. And it's being used, my friends, to destroy your very faith in that Son of God, that great Redeemer who is unto you your righteousness and your sanctification. He is your Redeemer, and there is nothing else that can or will redeem you but Jesus and His shed blood on the cross of Calvary, my friends. And that we ought to glorify the Lord that He hath done this and that He hath brought it unto us and given it unto our hands that we might know our Jesus, that we might be able to look to Him with full assurance of the wisdom of God and the righteousness of God 
of saints, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and that we might have full assurance of our sanctification, my friends, that God has sanctified us, and that God has set us apart from an old sinful walk of life. God is the one who approved us and rebuked us and caused us to see ourselves filthy and undone and unclean, that we might look to Him and be saved, all ye ends of the earth. And God hath done this. And it's not of my will, it's not of your will, it's not of the will of men, but it's of the will of God. And to say it any other way is to rob God of my friends. It's to rob God of His glory. Oh, how many do that very thing. They want to exalt themselves, they want to exalt you. It's all oh, you've got that will to make the decision on your own, and you don't. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord and not himself. Stop trying to hang on to a little bit of credit for your salvation. Stop trying to, in just a little bit, in a sense, glorify yourself for that little bit of good that you've been told you had when God's Word says there's nothing good about any of us. We are all wretched sinners, and we have all these things, not partly of ourselves, but fully of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And if we're going to glory, my friends, we need to glory in Him and His finished work on Calvary, where He redeemed us fully from all our sins, yea, even the sin of unbelief. So, oh, preacher, don't you know he died for all mankind? The Bible doesn't teach that at all. Those who want to hang on to that are hanging on to a vain idea. Well, we want to prove everybody's salvation when God says prove your own salvation and calling election and make it sure. Stop trying to prove everyone else's salvation and prove your own salvation by the word of God. God says you were not able to come unto him. God says you did not choose him, but he chose you unto salvation. And through his precious son, Jesus Christ, he predestined, he predetermined to do it, my friends. And through Jesus we have all these things, and it is written and declared unto us that we might know it according to the word of God, and that we should glory in him and not ourselves. We should not exalt ourselves. We should not glorify ourselves in the very least even. Don't kid yourself. Thinking that, well, I had the free will to choose and I made the choice. You were dead to God. Just as much as someone laying in a coffin is dead to you. And all your efforts to plead that person, get up and live. Get up and live falls on deaf ears, but you can't give them a hearing. You can't give them the hearing and the ability to see you there and to hear and understand what you're saying that they might respond to you, my friend. Just as you could not do it yourself, you could not make yourself see God and you could not make yourself hear God, you were dead to sin, or you were dead in sin, and you were dead to God. And you could not see this precious Savior for who he truly was. I was just a man, just a story being preached, foolishness of people putting their faith in that. That's what the world sees it. It's foolishness. Preaching of the gospel is foolishness. But by this foolishness, my friends, God has chosen to make known his will, to make known his Son, our Savior, and in through him is salvation, not any other, but only in through Jesus Christ. And when we're called and brought unto him and being made lowly and caused to reveal us our condition before him, we must give him all the glory. For he is our Lord and Savior. We are not worthy of it in the least. There's not anything good that we can or will do to be deserving of it. You cannot work for it. You cannot work to keep it. It's been given unto us by the grace of God. Both repentance and faith are the gift of God unto each of us that have believed. And looking unto him for salvation. And it is by God's power that he maintains us and keeps us unto the day when he'll come and call us out of this present life. It's by God's power. 
He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. If you're going to glory, going to get happy, be happy in the Lord, and glorify him for all these things which he hath done for his glory and his honor. Our God hath brought this to pass, and he hath made it to be so. And it is all in through Jesus Christ. Just as he created all things, and through Jesus Christ, and through Jesus Christ we have the new birth, the working of the power of it. I think we'll move on from there. And we enter into chapter 2 now of 1 Corinthians. And we will read these first few verses. Where it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech, my preaching, was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. My friends, as we realize that this is all tied together, when you move from chapter 1 to chapter 2 and in the old writings, that original Greek, there is no chapter and verse division there. It all ties together. So as he said, let he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord, he goes on to say, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, not with the wisdom of this world, his speech as it were, it was not with the excellency of speech as he declares of the wisdom of men, he didn't have to come with the such exhortation of things that showed forth you know he had, he had education Paul had education I'm sure in his day and time he could have stood and taught in any institution that existed then, could have taught them the things of God, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees after all he had education and he could have used a level of education which would have been above the common man. My friends, any minister goes out and he takes that education that he's had and he, he puts it on such a level where it's up here above the people, the common people. Their common knowledge and speaking and education. He puts If you put it up there above the people, then you make it complicated to the point where what is he talking about, they'd say. I don't understand some of those words he's using. What does that mean? No, he did not come with that excellency of speech of such words and things to claim unto them the testimony of God. But in this language which is set before us, it's at a fifth grade reading level. It's right there where the common man can hear and understand it. So, well, at least it was back then. I said, oh, nowadays it's got that old English. This isn't old English, my friends. No, not at all. You don't begin to understand what old English is. This is not old English. This is early modern English. Just one step back from where we're at now. And uh, that English language, she's gone through the process to where she was at this point when they created this version. And then just a, uh, a little bit past that, a little alteration made to update it just a bit. Be it still enough there that holds it all together where they were at at that point. But where we're at today, my friends, our society is destroying its language. Creating such terms. We're at the point now to where we're just destroying terms. All uh, grandfather, granddad, mom, dad, mother, father. All these words are just being written out of existence. We're just a person. You're just a person. I'm just a person. They want to have that neutral identity, which is contrary to everything nature sets before us and teaches us. And with that wisdom <coughs> and excellency of words which men in these days would speak, they've gotten away from the simplicity of the gospel even at times. And that's what he's really saying here. That I came forth with simplicity of speech 
not using high words of education that would be above the common man. I wanted them to be able to understand what I was setting before them, Paul saying, that my speech, as I have declared unto you the testimony of God, who declared unto the people of this world, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased in, even Jesus Christ, that they might see him, and that they might understand. And he speaks of it there that he determined not to know anything among them save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now my friends are those who use that as excuse to not teach anything else but the gospel. Not preach anything else but the gospel. And Paul is certainly not saying I only came to preach the gospel or with nothing else. Well if that was so he wouldn't have talked about 90% of the stuff he has in Corinthians. No would he? No he wouldn't. Have. He goes way beyond that doesn't he? teaching and preaching a lot of things unto them that were needy for them, that went beyond just Jesus Christ and the cross where he suffered and died. That is the basic foundation. That's what he came with first, that basic preaching of the gospel. That people might hear it, and that they might believe upon him in whom God sent, his son, who suffered and bled and died for us, shed his precious blood to us, for us to redeem us by his blood. This he came declaring unto them that they might first of all see Jesus and know him as their Lord and Savior. He was keeping that great commission. And those that received that message with gladness and joy in their hearts and believed upon that Lord and that Savior, he baptized them. He also says, well, God sent me not to baptize. Which is a strange statement if you think about it. Because too many people get influenced or get focused on the activity that's being done and not the action of God that's involved in it. Oh, they were baptizing people. They were baptizing people. That must be saving them. No, it wasn't. And he will explain that as he gets into it later on. But that focus he had primarily first in preaching to them the things of God. And once there were those that believed, he would baptize those. And then he would organize a local visible church, which is what we have here at Corinth. A body, the body in Christ at Corinth. The body is a local visible body, just like any person's body is a local visible body that can be seen and touched and the influence can be felt all around about us. That's what he came to establish in through the preaching of the gospel, following that great commission and doing what they were told to do, to go forth and preach the word and baptize them and make disciples of them. And then who would begin to teach them the old things? that local visible assembly and the one that God would give unto them to be their pastor to preach and teach unto them the whole counsel of God Paul was a missionary in a sense and he was he didn't he didn't want to sit down in one place and stay there and teach and teach them people for years and years on end he did stay in certain places for a time but he had a calling and a place to be at and to go to from time to time and he knew eventually it was leading to one particular place, which would be his last stop. That's Rome. But he went out on those three missionary journeys to all the regions where God allowed him to go unto. And yes, there were places, but the Holy Spirit said, No, you're not going there. All oh, some of these today get all bent out of shape over that kind of thinking. Oh, we got to go everywhere. No, none of us has to go everywhere. But all of us need to go where God sends us and preach the gospel to those that God sends us to and those that receive it with gladness and joy in their hearts, baptize them and organize churches that they might then be taught the whole counsel of God in the church, in that local visible church. But when they come forth, even as Paul did here, it should not be in self-glorification, self-exaltation, and a uh, show forth of great strength of ourselves. No, we ought not, uh, you know, uh, dress ourselves up and look like, well, we're just that perfect person. Uh, not, you know, and we ought to be like the common man. Go out, but uh, he didn't go out and try to act and look and dress above the common man. He tried to look like them. He, he wanted to be 
a fellow person with him. That is a fellow laborer in a sense. That whether it be with the tent makers, he was a tent maker. Whether it be with other things, he was like unto them that he might preach them with the gospel. Not that in any, any way or shape or form did he live in sin or do that which is against God, as some would try to do. You can't do ungodly things and say at the same time, well, I'm out here and I'm doing this, I'm preaching the gospel. How foolish it is <clears throat> for some woman to stand up and say, I'm a stripper for the gospel. I get out here and I take my clothes off and I tell them about my Jesus. Well, my friends, that's ridiculous. You cannot commit a sin and do evil and ungodly things like that and glorify God. God hates it. He does not bless it. It's not his way. It's not the way in which he intended to bring these things about. But Paul, as he went forth preaching that gospel and declaring that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God, he came forth with weakness and in fear and much trembling. In that weakness of his own flesh, knowing that he could not rely upon it, for he had that thorn in the flesh, even which he besought God thrice to take away, and God told him, in, my, in weakness, my strength is made perfect. For in our weakness, as we go forth in our weakness and acknowledging, knowing that we are weak in this flesh and that we are prone to be led and the flesh wants to lead us away from serving God like we ought to, we are to rely upon God's grace, God's mercy to provide us that which we have need of even daily and in a fear, in a sense, to know that if we neglect such a great salvation, it's under our own hurt. It would hurt our testimony and our witness and make us ineffectual to those that we would then seek to reach. But in that fear, and it's a reverential fear of God who we know is a God over all creation who is going to rain down fire upon this earth eventually and judge this world. But we warn people in and through the preaching of the gospel to repent lest you perish for the judgment of God, my friends, is coming. Repent while you still can. For the judgment of God is coming, my friends. And we do that in trembling and fear. As Paul did it, he did it in through that power of the Spirit, feeling that presence of Almighty God in and through him and all around about him and that Holy Spirit of God working in those apostles and those early saints and those early church age here in a way that he does not now work because that which is perfect has come. They prophesied in part and they knew in part. They prophesied and proclaimed the word of God in part because they only knew the word of God in part. And that Holy Spirit had to give them leadership and understanding on how they ought to present it and set it before the people. How they ought to teach this New Testament church age doctrine. This New Testament age of not looking, any, not looking forward any longer, my friends, to a Savior that's coming, but now looking back to a Savior that has come and fulfilled all things, yea, who had redeemed his people from all their sins by suffering and dying up there at Calvary on that cross, and his blood being shed, in through him we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. In through him we have a righteousness. And all these things he was preaching unto them, as he said of it, not if with enticing words of men, but with the basic things which God would give unto him to do in that condition of weakness and fear and trembling, relying upon the Holy Spirit of God to lead him and to use him in that right way which would bring glory and honor unto God, demonstrating the things of God in and through the Spirit of God as it used him to speak. And as that Spirit of God and the power of God which flowed through him, God used him at times to place his hand upon or hands upon people and God through him healed people. Paul declared, this is not my hands, or this is not my power, it's God's power. It's God doing this through me, he said. God through him, healing those who were sick, and the lame, and casting out the demons. God in through him, giving him the understanding of these New Testament 
doctrine, this New Testament teaching, which he would have to eventually write down, and already he's writing them down. This this book to Corinth here, this letter to Corinth, was what he was writing down eventually about his way of life, how he came unto them, and about all these things that God would have that church of Corinth to know. But not just them, my friends, but all of us. That's why we have the Word of God. These things that God has sent unto us that have been written down, that we might know and understand what the will of God is, and we might see how that He hath prophesied to bring all this to pass, about how that He did bring it to pass, and that we can have full assurance that the things are yet still out in front of us in the future, that God's going to bring them to pass. Even our glorification, be a presence of our Lord and our Savior. And that God is going to judge this world in righteousness, and He's going to burn it with fire and destroy it. And none will be able to stand in that great terrible day. No one will. All you gainsayers, all you deniers, oh, there is no God. Oh, don't you know we evolved out of the buck and the mire? Keep telling yourself that. For the day is coming, my friends, when you're going to see fearful sights in the skies above, and you're going to be caused to want to flee and to find a hole to crawl into and to hide from the presence of something up there in the sky that you want to get away from. And you want to know what it is? When who it is, it's God. God's going to manifest himself in a way to this world that they can no longer deny that there is a God in heaven. They'll no longer be able to deny that there is a God who created this world and everything in it and everything in the heavens above. Paul came forth preaching unto them that Lord and that Savior, the only begotten Son of that God, God the Father, who determined to send first his servants, his prophets. They killed them. The prophets foretold of the coming of the Son, that Emmanuel, God with us. And when he came, they didn't recognize him for who he was. They would not have this man to rule over him. He, he wasn't the kind of king they wanted, nor, nor were they looking for that kind of king. So they crucified him, but yet that had to come to pass. He had to suffer, bleed, and die to redeem us from all our sins. But he did not stay dead, my friends. He arose from that grave with newness of life, and in through him we have our life eternal. We have our righteousness through him. And it's this wisdom, the wisdom of God, which he came setting before them, not the wisdom and the thinking of men, but the wisdom of God, and through the demonstration of the Spirit and power of God, he set these things before men. And God impressed it upon those that heard, and he saved the people out from among them everywhere he went. No, not everyone was saved. Not everyone will be saved. And to those who want to hang on to that idea, go ahead. But don't give up hanging on to Jesus. Don't give up believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior, and fully trust in Him and Him alone. Don't put your trust in your works. Don't put your trust in your baptism. Don't put your trust in the Lord's Supper. Don't put your trust in the membership with any religious body. My friends, we're out of time. May God bless you until we meet again. May God bless his word. May God be with you.